Hey, First Family, let's give a warm welcome to Jeff in his new official role as our Minister of Music and Media. <laughs> Blessed by you already, my brother. Let's start with some good news. Who could use some? Oh, gosh, I thought somebody might need some. It's raining outside. Let's praise the Lord for that. Okay, missed. Okay, it's just wet. Let's just praise the Lord that, that that even. When I got out this morning, I saw fog. I was like, what is this? Praise the Lord for it. I've not seen it in a long time in Midland, but we're glad to have it just the same. Let's start with some more good news. So this week was Ash Wednesday, the official beginning of the preparation for Easter. We joined our church with three others at the First Methodist Church downtown for a traditional Ash Wednesday service with the applied ashes on the forehead and the whole bit. It was tremendous. We had over 700 people who came to join us, friends. That was an awesome night of worship and to praise the Lord. This is a wonderful way to start our celebration of Easter. Let's do one more bit of good news. The Spirit of God is moving in Midland, Texas. I believe that with every fiber of my being. We see it all around us. That Wednesday night meeting was just a symptom, but the disease, you might say, I hope all of us get it, where the Spirit of God just gets all over us, and the Spirit of God moves in us where we just can't help but tell what God has done for us. That's my prayer today. Now, my friend Mark read so well, verses 6 to 11. I want to read to you verse 12 through the end of the chapter, and I'll tell you why at the end of our, our, our reading. Behold, Jesus said, I'm coming soon. I'm bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they have the right to the tree of life that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I'm the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Spirit and bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of these, this prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to them the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from them, away from the words of this book of prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, surely I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Now, you might say, so if you wanted that read, Darren, why didn't you let Mark read it? That's a good question. It's hard to read big sections, and it's even harder to listen that long. That's why I broke it up that way. But why read it out loud at all? So we've done 40-ish talks on Revelation over the last year. You're in some change. In that time period, if you were here for all of them, then you have heard read for you the entire book of Revelation. Maybe you've never made it all the way through a book in the Bible. You have now. Friends, it's important that we engage in the Word of God. We'll talk about that in again, um, again in a minute. Let's pray together, shall we? We love you, Lord Jesus. Let's just start there. We love you for the rain that you sent to us. We love you, Lord, for giving us this day. We love you, Lord, for putting us together in this place. We love you, Lord, for giving us the breath we have to praise you. We love you, Lord, for giving your life for us on the cross. We love you for the promise to return. We love you, Jesus, for all that you are, all that you promised to be, and all that you will be in eternity forward. We just love you, Jesus. So today, my prayer is that we would embrace that love and that we would receive your word, these last words of revelation, and that you would help us to know, Jesus, what it means to trust you and your coming. We know, Lord, your coming is sooner than it ever has been. 
Maybe not upon us today, but then again, maybe it is. Prepare us now for it, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, my friends, there are 11 final messages in these verses that we're using today. They are the last part of the vision. They are the closing part of the book. The Apostle John receives them almost like things are being thrown at him. It's almost like dodgeball, you know what I'm saying? And he's ducking or catching them, and he's just moving back and forth. I want to give you these final 11 messages as the last part of it. Let's start with this one. Number one, trust the words of this letter, for they are faithful and true. Verse six, and he said to me, the angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent the angel to show his servants what must soon take place. These two words, faithful or trustworthy and true, it means that you can build upon them. Now, I don't know beans about building a house other than I want somebody else to do it for me. You know what I mean? But I know this. If you don't have a good foundation, your house isn't going to stand long. Well, where did you learn that? Matthew chapter 7. There Jesus talks about the two types of builders. One, a wise builder. One who builds his house on the rock. The other, a foolish builder. <coughs> Excuse me who builds his house on the sand. They both have the same problem not long after they finish. The waters rise, and as the waters come up, guess what happens to that house built on the sand? The sand gets washed away, and they're left with nothing because it collapses. The one who built on the rock, though, he has no fear. Sure, he might get a little soggy, a little water damage maybe, but the house doesn't collapse. I want to tell you, friends, if you want your house to stand, build it on these trustworthy, faithful, and true words that you will find only in the pages of Scripture. If you're unsure of where to begin building, start here. Let these words serve as the building block of the rest of your life. This is an important note as we close this out, because like then, as today, there are a lot of people saying, well, the Bible didn't really mean what it said. What it really meant was, insert whatever personal preference you might have. The Bible didn't really mean what it said. We hear that a lot, don't we? Either that or we hear a variation of it, which is, well, the Bible was written so long ago, we have to modernize it. We have to bring it into our world. So we have to contextualize it. Had the Apostle Paul, had the Apostle John, had Jesus lived in our day, this is what he would think. And amazingly, magically, it's a miracle. It always matches with what I think. I caution you, friends. Our words are neither trustworthy or true. But these words are. If you want to build a life that stands, start here. Here's the second message. This message will bring a blessing to the one who studies and obeys. Now, if you have a red letter version of the Bible, one where the letters, the, the words of Jesus are in red, then in verse 7, it switches over. This is Jesus speaking. <coughs> Behold, I'm coming soon. <laughs> Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Joshua, will you bring me one of those bottles of water down there, butter boy? It's good to have my son in the service today. Thanks, bud. Isn't he a good-looking kid? Or maybe that's just my opinion. <laughs> He'll kill me for saying that later, but it'd be all right. When Jesus... When Jesus proclaims something, we do well to listen. I want you to take your pen and I want you to underline. It's not blasphemy. I want you to underline something in your Bible where Jesus says, I am coming soon. Some have said, well, where did Jesus promise that? Right here. Now you know. I'm coming soon. Now, soon is a flexible term. Soon for Jesus may not be soon for us. A lot of people, they read soon and they're thinking, hey, Jesus is due back this week. 
Others have said, well, Jesus is coming back. I still have a copy of a book in my library in my office that I got my first month on the job as a youth pastor when I was a student at Dallas Baptist. 88 reasons why Jesus will return in 1988. It hasn't aged very well. Let me just tell you that right now, all right? 35 years later, we're still waiting. I caution you, though, because I want you to see this reality that Jesus proclaims. If the words of this book are trustworthy and true, if these are things we can build our lives on, then let's build from this point going out. Behold, I'm coming soon, Jesus said. Then this is the truism that matters most of all. Blessed is the one who keeps in the words of the prophecy of this book. Jesus isn't just talking about revelation. He's talking about the whole smash, all of it. Let's pause here and say, thank God that he has made it so clear for us. We know what to look for. We even know where he's coming from. If we take the whole copy of Scripture, then we know that he's coming from the east, and we know that he'll come like a thief in the night. He'll show up when we least expect him. But for him, his declaration remains, I'm coming soon. Here's the third message. These words should compel you to worship. Verse 8, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Would you just underline that too? Make sure that you're directing your worship to the right place. We talked about this last week and a couple of weeks before that. There's only one who is truly worthy of worship, and it's not us. It's God. We saw it in Revelation 4 and 5. We saw it in Revelation 7. We see it in Revelation 21. Friends, this, this moment of worship declares something that we desperately need to hear. Let's make sure we're pointed in the right place to worship because this much we know for sure. The children were right when they sang just a minute ago. I was made to worship. Indeed, you were too. And because of that, let us worship the only one who is truly worthy of worship because these words should compel me to worship. Message four, this message is to be a regular part of a believer's study. See it in verse 10 and 11. And he said to me, don't seal up these words of the prophecy of this book for the time is near. Let the evildoers still do evil, the filthy still be filthy, the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. This sealing up, it means we're done with the book. It means we can put it away, we can mark it completed, and it'll go finished on our shelves. Notice what the angel says. Don't seal it up. Keep it open. Keep it handy. In other words, let these words soak into your soul. Let me just tell you something, friends. Today, Today, I'm going to encourage you again to spend time every day in the Bible. If you're not sure where to start, then find one of our two reading plans. They're out here in the Welcome Center in the chapel for you. You can find them there. And why is that important? Well, let's just say this. If we're going to keep this commandment that the angel has just given to us, it means that we need to spend time in the Bible every day. Now, some of you immediately, as soon as I started on this, you rolled your eyes. Here he goes again. Why is that such a big deal? And let's be even more honest and say, for those of us following our annual plan, we're in Leviticus, or more popularly known, the place where reading plans go to die. You can be honest enough to say amen to that. Because I want to tell you, it's tough getting through that. But what if I told you, what if I told you that in today's reading, Leviticus 19 and 20, in today's reading... You can see the footprints of Jesus if you know how to look. Leviticus 19, 9 and 10, there's the commandment to harvest a certain way. Don't cut the edges, the commandment says. Let those be for those who are poor and needy. It's called gleaning. If you drop something that you've harvested, don't pick it up. That's for those who are poor and needy. If you jump ahead 
oh, I don't know, maybe six or eight books, you'll find yourself at the book of Ruth. Short little book, one of the shortest in the, in the Old Testament. There you'll find the story of Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi. They are residents of Midian. They are a long way from Israel. And then Naomi's husband dies and Ruth's husband dies. And so together, mother and daughter-in-law come home to Bethlehem. I'm going somewhere. Keep going with me, all right? They come home to Bethlehem. And knowing the commandment about the gleaning, Naomi says, Ruth, go out to this particular field and glean it because the law allows for that. Out Ruth goes to pick up the gleaning. And there she happens to find a handsome landowner. His name is Boaz. Boaz. Together they would have a child who would be the grandfather of King David who is the predecessor of King Jesus. If there's no gleaning, there's no Ruth, there's no Boaz. They don't find each other. Even in Leviticus, if you know how to look, you can find the footprints of Jesus. Can I tell you today, my friends, it's worth doing. You might say, well, Darren and all, you're fancy learning. That's how you know that. Maybe so. Or maybe I have a study Bible. You can get one too. Or maybe I just looked at it online and read some of the notes there. Friends, this is the thing. What you really care about, you will make time for. And that's why the, the angel commands us to make sure that our priorities are clear. See it in verse 11? Let the evildoers still do evil, the filthy still be filthy, the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. So th those who are just wired that way, they're going to continue that way. But I want to tell you, friends, here's the good news. That's not the end of the story. We'll come back to it. Let's get to that fifth message. We're running out of time already. Jesus' return is soon and certain. Here he is again, verse 12. Behold, I'm coming soon, Jesus said, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Here is the central feature of our hope. To hear Jesus say, I'm coming soon, brings that hope ever closer to us. And not only is he coming, but he's coming with his reward to repay those who are due. This is a wonderful word. And to seal it, in verse 13, he speaks to his identity, who he is. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. For those of you that may not know, Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet, Omega is the last. For someone to declare they are both Alpha and Omega is to declare that they are eternal in nature. That everything from all of eternity past until all of eternity future falls in him. Nobody asked you, Siri. My watch talking to me. It's a blessing. You'll be glad to. Um, yeah, never mind. I want to ask you, though, what would you do if you knew Jesus was coming to your house? What would you do if you thought I was coming? And don't say dust the top of the refrigerator. Heaven help us. I'd, Mine is just as dirty as yours, and I see it every day. It doesn't bother. That's no reflection on my wife, I want to be clear. That's my job, and I'll, yeah. You might put out the fancy towels, the one that had the monogram on them, or the fancy little soaps. You know the one I mean? The ones that look like little roses or little boats, the ones that are made that way, but they're not really meant to be used. That brings us to the sixth one. Preparation for the Lord's return must be proactive. See it in verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life. They may enter the city by the, by the gates. If I knew Jesus was coming to my house, what would I do? I dare say I would be proactive in preparing for him. Since you know Jesus is coming to your spiritual house, perhaps today is the day to prepare for that. Let's move on to the seventh message. There will be some who will reject Jesus. Do not let them distract you. See it in verse 15. Outside, outside the gates, that is, are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, 
the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Friends, let's be clear. Even in this late stage of the book of Revelation, with just a few verses to go in the Bible, we are warned there are those who will stand outside the gates. It's not that they're unwelcome. It's that they don't want the invitation. They're happy in their sin and like it. You know what I pray often for those that I talk to that turn Jesus down? I pray that they will get sick. Sick, sick, sick of their sin. See, when I was in junior high school, one of my buddies, his dad smoked, and one day he caught my buddy smoking one of his cigarettes. And his dad said, I'm so glad that you have caught on to my wonderful habit. Let's just sit down and smoke together. He had my friend smoke an entire pack of cigarettes in one sitting. He barfed his ever-loving brains out. And you might say, well, that's child abuse, Darren. Isn't it, though? I'm glad it wasn't me. But my friend has never smoked since then. He got sick of it. And that was the whole point. My prayer is that if you're not sick of your sin, that God will make you sick of it, sick enough to walk away from it permanently. Let's move on to the eighth message. The message is from Jesus himself. See it in verse 16 where it's red letters again. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. For the churches. Now, was it just for the seven churches way back in Revelation 3? Or was it more than that? Well, you know the answer. It's more. It's meant to be more. It's for the churches, including First Baptist Church of Midland. And then Jesus speaks to his identity again. He is the Alpha and the Omega, meaning he is eternal in nature and always has been. But he's also, get this, the root and descendant of David, the bright and morning star. It means he broke into history. He became like one of us. And he came with an invitation, a simple one, that's reiterated in the ninth message, come, a simple invitation for all. Verse 17, the spirit and the bride say come, let, and let the one who hears say come, let the one who is thirsty come, let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Receiving the invitation to come means I gotta leave where I am. Consider this with me for a minute. I can't go there and stay here at the same time. In order to go there, I have to leave here. Now you might say, well, Darren, that's pretty knuckle-headed. Of course, but many of us say we want to go with God and stay where we are at the same time. All the while, God's calling us away, calling us to himself. See this at the end of verse 17. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. The invitation is to drink it in, to take it, to come. You'll find a similar invitation in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, where Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Oh, brothers and sisters, beloved, this is the hope that not all of us are broken. We can be made whole simply by accepting the invitation Jesus offers us. Message 10, don't change the message. Verses 18 and 19. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to them the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life in the holy city, which are described in this book. The final warning in this book is to leave these words as you found them. To change them in any way, adding or taking away, is to invite the sure and certain wrath of God. Don't be arrogant enough to think you can dodge it. Change this book and expect destruction. Can I tell you today, my friends, don't change what's in here. You might say, well, Darren, who would presume to? There are many. There are many. We live in a culture that says truth is subjective. Your truth is your truth, and 
my truth is my truth, and if the two happen to agree, then fine, but you don't have any right to tell me what's true. Can I tell you today, my friends, that in itself is a truism. That in itself is a statement of truth, to declare that there is no truth, when all the while, oh, there is, definitely. There is a truth, and his name is Jesus, and he came with an invitation, an invitation to come. He spread his arms wide open on the cross to say, come. He climbed down off of the cross and was buried in a borrowed tomb to say, come. He opened the door of that tomb, not so he could get out, so that we could get in and see that it was empty. His invitation is still, come. Come. So why don't more people come? Because they are too happy where they are. Their arrogance, their pride. The law of God doesn't apply to me. I can do what I like. You can, but only for a time. Eventually, you will stand before Jesus. And that brings us to this final word of hope, promise, and assurance. The last two verses declare something we desperately need to hear. He who testifies to these things, meaning Jesus himself, says, Surely, I'm coming soon. If you're one who underlines in your Bible, underline that. Here we are at the very close of the book, where it gets real skinny on the back side, you know? And Jesus is telling us the plot line one last time. Surely, I'm coming soon. I want you to see how John responds immediately after Jesus said that, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Now, many of us think amen is just the word you say at the end of a prayer. And indeed it is, but there's nothing wrong with that word in and of itself. But let's make sure we know what it means. What does it mean? It means so be it. So be it. And then John comes right behind it with, come, Lord Jesus. And then with a prayer, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. And evidence, I might add, that John was a Texan. That word all at the end is a plural word. If you ever pick up a copy of the Darren Wood International Translation, the DWI for short, then you'll find it translated, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with y'all. Because that's the essence of what Jesus wanted. He came to bring you something that you could not find on your own. So now let's finalize the, the, the talk. Revelation has two purposes, a word of warning to those outside of Christ. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is closer than it's ever been. Turn away from your sin and turn to Jesus so that you can avoid the penalties that are described in this book. It's a word of warning to those outside of Christ, but it's also, and this is the best part, it's also a word of encouragement to those that are in Christ, a word of hope, a word of life, a word of joy. Things will not always be as they are. Now I wonder, <clears throat> if I ask you, which one of those two is it for you? Which one would you choose? If you were honest today and you said, it's the word of warning, Darren, I don't know then here's good news. Today, you can know. At the close, in just a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing, and when we do, here's what I want you to do if you want to know. Come down and talk with me about how you can make Jesus the Lord and Master of your life. Today is your day, friend. Maybe, just maybe, you're here and you'd say, I need to do that. Today is your day. And what do I do then, Darren? What do I do then? Well, here's good news. The next step is made clearer earlier in Scripture. Baptism. It's the first step of Christian obedience. It means that you contact us and, or come down here and say, I want to be baptized. And we'll talk about how that can come together. We delight in that. Well, what do I do then? You find a church family to walk with you, to be a part of what, you're doing, what God is doing locally. For us, we'd be delighted to have you as a part of that. And then the sanctifying work, the 
process of knocking off the rough edges begins as we walk together, waiting on the return of Jesus. Sometimes in that waiting, there's some burdens, some heavy things that we have to carry. Maybe you need to bring them to this altar. Or maybe it's not things that you're burdened for for yourself. Maybe it's something that you're burdened for for someone else. You need to come to this altar and lay it down. Today is your day, friends. What will you do with it? Pray with me, won't you? I'm so glad, Lord, we had this time to share together today. For we know this is a gift. My prayer today, Lord, is that we would be mindful of the limited nature of time and that your return is closer now than it's ever been. I pray for those who are right now feeling the draw of your spirit, the tug at their heart, the whisper in their ear that says, Darren's talking to you, that they would find freedom to move out, to step out boldly and say, yes, Jesus, I'll respond to you. I pray for those who have responded to you but haven't lived like it. Let today be a day of repentance, of turn. I pray, Lord, for all of us that we would walk confidently in the light of the promise that you've made that you are coming soon. Move in this place, Jesus. Let your spirit blow through these place, these walls. And thank you, Lord, for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's your chance, my friends. What will you do with what Jesus has spoken to you? Come as we stand and sing.